Weddings never go according to plan. The big day should be about the happy couple, but more often than not, it ends up being about parents. This was never made more evident to me than when I proposed to my beautiful, talented, and badass girlfriend, now wife, Sam. She was raised by two no-bullshit people, her tough, supportive dad, David, and her incredibly kind and empathetic mom, Susan. Together, David and Susan owned and operated the oldest, roughest bar in San Jose in the late 80s and early 90s, expanding their family to include nearly every barfly that walked through the door. Their working-class upbringings and Sicilian sensibilities are evident in their incredibly strong and resilient daughter. My family and I are the polar opposite. I am an extremely non-confrontational, big-dreaming Jewish kid from Salt Lake City, the son of two broadcast journalists who are sweet, sensitive, and almost the epitome of how to live a straight, narrow, middle-class life. My mom and dad have always played by the rules with the unspoken expectation I'd do the same. Marry in your 20s, build a career by your 30s, purchase a house in your 40s, and then purchase another one in your mid-40s. Just think of the equity. <laughs> Deep down, I think my family secretly wishes we could go rogue more often, if only we just knew how. Every time we try to be rebellious, it falls apart, and we usually end up relying on one tried and true tactic, passive aggressive avoidance. <laughs> Two families with little, if any, overlap, now on a collision course to becoming one. Before marriage was ever on the table, David always insisted that his one and only daughter just needed to get married in the backyard with a case of champagne. It was sensible love, but love nonetheless. Neither Sam nor I wanted a lot of pomp and circumstance when it came to getting hitched, but we did want something more than a box of brute in the backyard. When asked if we'd set a date, our party line was always, next summer. We were in no rush to get married, just enjoying our engagement, a sensation that didn't last long. Three weeks after I popped the question, Susan was diagnosed with metastatic cancer that was rapidly spreading all over her body. The prognosis was hardly optimistic, though there was a strong current of hope in the air since Susan was a cancer survivor from years before I knew her. She was a fighter that first round, she'd be a fighter the second time around, going into the ring with quiet confidence and a realistic outlook for what was on the horizon. Not once did I see her wallow in pity in her situation. Time and again, it would be Susan who rose to the occasion of compassionately comforting her loved ones, all shocked and scared. A hug from her could soothe away the fear. She took care of us as much as we took care of her, maybe more. I think we need to do the wedding sooner the next summer, Sam said, a lot sooner. One of the many things I love about Sam is her ability to read the room, <laughs> very honestly. Here was her family's no bullshit DNA in full effect. Because of it, we made the call to move the wedding date up. Susan's birthday was in a few months, making it the perfect springtime date to tie the knot. The silver lining to all of this was that Sam and I are reality TV show junkies, so we were thrilled to now officially call ourselves 90 Day Fiancés, about to say, I do, in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> David and Susan generously offered to secure us a small venue with some choice, but not too fancy catering. They went shopping with Sam to find an off-the-rack, no-alterations dress at a strip mall, keeping costs at a minimum in order to focus on what really mattered. Sam and I felt like we were in good hands. That is, until finding out what my parents were secretly planning for the wedding. Hiring a troupe of Jewish bottle dancers to be the entertainment. <laughs> Not familiar? Come to the yeshiva with me! <laughs> 
Jewish bottle dancers are without a doubt very impressive at doing complex Eastern European choreography while balancing bottles on their head. Real talent and skill goes into this art form of my people, you know, the chosen people. But in no way did Sam or I want a troop of them showing up at our wedding unannounced, dressed like extras from Fiddler on the Roof, asking, is this the Greenberg wedding? <laughs> to which we would answer, no, this is the DeSalvo Arky wedding. To which the head dancer would respond, wait a minute, Yaakov, Samantha, it is you! Yoni, Nachum, Rafi, over here! At which point the Meshuggah Quartet would shuffle onto the dance floor to do their so Jewish, it was almost anti-Semitic routine in front of everyone. Honestly, this was all my fault and the product of what happens when your family lacks healthy boundaries with communication. I had told my parents I did want to honor our Jewish heritage in some way at the ceremony or reception. What I meant was stepping on a glass or getting hoisted up in a chair while doing the hora. Not this. Anything but this. Sam and I had another tough call to make, this time to my parents. We spilled the beans about their big surprise and insisted while it was a nice thought, we did not want the bottle dancers. The phone was unusually quiet. Stark cold until my dad begrudgingly said he'd look into maybe canceling. Only problem was he'd already put down a deposit and not to stereotype my people, but that was gonna be a tough shekel to get back. <laughs> I could tell my parents, particularly my dad, was heartbroken by our request to cease and desist. I was their first child to get married and they didn't know how they fit into the wedding. We were facing a bigger situation though, potentially losing Susan to the tumors growing inside her body. Time was of the essence. In their heart of hearts, my mom and dad believed that laughter would ease all of this. It wasn't meant to be a big joke played on us for a semi-cheap goof. It was truly meant to be a mitzvah. Only it backfired. And when it did, it led to the rockiest moment in my relationship with my parents. My dad pulled a gut-wrenching card of passive-aggressive shame one he'd sworn never to use because his parents often pulled it on him. He stopped speaking to me. For months, if we did need to communicate, it was only through my mom, who was often at a loss for words herself. The silent treatment worked, cutting deep. Luckily, COVID-19 solved all our problems <laughs> because our first wedding was scheduled to take place on March 28th, 2020. I even sewed the date into my jacket. The whole ordeal was promptly canceled two weeks out when the rest of the world shut down. And if you think planning a wedding is a nightmare, canceling a wedding due to a global pandemic is its own form of psychosis. Well, it kept Yoni, Nachum, and Rafi out of our lives, it was still terrible for so many reasons we all remember. The only beacon of hope at that time was that Susan's treatments were slowing the cancer down, yielding small yet positive results. If all went according to plan, she'd be cancer-free by the start of summer. In June, Sam and I drove up to Reno to celebrate Susan's final round of treatment, staying outside, socially distanced and masked, to party with barbecue, beers, and old stories. We had emerged victorious. And then our little world stopped again. Susan went to the hospital for her final treatment. Only this time the doctor informed her that the cancer had aggressively returned. She didn't have much time, a month, maybe less. Death was everywhere at this point, but now it had come into our home and we couldn't escape it no matter how hard we tried. That night, Sam and I had the same thought. We need to do our wedding as soon as possible so Susan can be there. 
The good news about canceling a wedding you planned in three months is that you have all the pieces ready to go for a wedding in three weeks. Outfits hanging in the closet, sound equipment in the trunk of the car, and our new venue, Sam's childhood backyard in the middle of Susan's garden, where she grew with care and tenderness exactly where David had predicted their daughter would get married all those years ago. Only instead of a case of champagne, we had a fully loaded bar that would put BevMo to shame. <laughs> so yeah, we made the call to get married in Reno at the height of hot COVID summer. We whittled down the guest list to essential family and a handful of our very closest friends. No worries if you can't make it, we completely understand. But if you do come, we'll provide you with custom-made masks and hand, and hand sanitizer. You'll also need a COVID test with the kind of results we're looking for. Leave your negativity at the door. Our minimized ceremony had little dogs running around the tapestry of floral colors in Susan's garden, broadcast for our online guests in everyone's first Zoom wedding ever. We danced on the porch to our favorite songs late into the night, smoked cigars by the fire with friends, cried joyously in the living room watching video toasts from those who couldn't be there. Unlike most newlyweds who can barely recall their blurry day of wedded bliss, we made lasting memories, and on top of it all, not a single person contracted COVID at our wedding. Yes. The only thing I wish I didn't remember quite so vividly was my parents' speech. Well, I knew they were still irritated we hadn't endorsed the bottle dancers. I really wanted to get their blessing on our marriage. <laughs> Sunrise, sunset, am I right? <laughs> Having been on the local evening news for decades, I knew my parents could write and give a speech that packed a punch, but that night the punching was below the belt. My mom barely said five words. A strange opening. She then tossed it over to my dad, whose lengthy toast boiled down to thanking my new bride for coming along. Otherwise, his slut of a son was never going to stop gobbling up from the all-you-can-eat buffet of women. <laughs> Humor is my dad's love language. Me at the sizzler of pussy? Hilarious! <laughs> but by the time he finished, it was obvious that the joke didn't land at all, and I saw my dad publicly shamed with embarrassing silence that we all felt. This little hiccup didn't ruin the wedding, however, not by a long shot. As David would go on to repeat in the months and years to come, you could have had a bigger wedding, but not a better wedding. How very true. If you're getting married, no need to invite us. We've already been to the best wedding of our lives, and it was our own. The only dark cloud that hangs over our wedding day came a few weeks later, when Susan died, having fought her cancer with elegance, grace, dignity, and stunning fortitude to the very end. Most people never go back to their wedding venue, let alone as a place to mourn, this time feeling the sunken pain in the heart that is endless. The living room where we raised glasses of cheer hung heavy with despair and sadness in every corner. Susan's garden in late summer, the literal fruits of labor from her heart on full display, was missing an essential component. At the time of harvest, there was nothing to sow but grief, despair, and anguish. <laughs> If weddings bring out the worst in parents, funerals sometimes bring out the best. I'd never seen David cry like he did as he spread Susan's ashes along the flower beds that she tended to for all those years. Public displays of emotion are not his go-to thing, but that day he did not hold back and I love him for it. I also have never seen so many people show up for someone they love so much the way they did for Susan including my own parents. 
It took a wedding and a funeral to admit that while we have immense love and respect for each other, Sam and I are living our lives completely different from all of our parents. Our marriage went through hell and back in less than a month. So we're not scared to follow our dreams, waiting to have kids until we feel like it, and shockingly not being homeowners, perhaps ever. (laughs) Now that I'm not eating out at the pussy buffet every night, (laughs) and have found the love of my life, my parents and I can have a real relationship as adults. We are honest and open with each other in ways that are new and a bit scary, but also feel mature and significant. Added bonus, my mom and dad, for the first time, have a daughter to share those parts with, too. All of us have shown up for each other in the hardest of times, a true bond of shared family. While we're all learning to love each other in our own way, which, for better or worse, richer or poor, seems to be growing stronger and deeper every day. I could have had other parents, but not better parents. (laughs) That goes for all four of them. 